Hello everyone, welcome again to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about independence and conditional independence. It's difficult to overstate how important these concepts are for probabilistic modeling. We'll see the reasons later on, but essentially a lot of probabilistic modeling is just assuming stuff is independent or conditionally independent. Okay, so the goal here is going to be to define independence precisely and then unconditional independence, of course, and then to apply the definition on real data and, and see what happens. The prerequisites for this material are uh, conditional probability, and uh, you also have to know about estimating probabilities from data, which is the previous video. Okay, so the definition of the independence of two events is actually very simple and very intuitive. We say that two events are independent if when we condition on one of them, and remember that we can see conditioning as revealing new information. So when we consider the probability of A given B, we know that outcomes are gonna be in B. So now what is the probability of A, right? Like how should we update the probability of A? What should be the posterior probability of A? Now that we know that we're conditioning on B. Well, when we do that, and the probability of A does not change. It's the same as the prior probability, probability of A. So it doesn't matter if we know that B happened or not. Um, in that case, we say that A and B are independent, which is um, very intuitive. Equivalently, we say that A and B are independent if the probability of the intersection is equal to uh, the product of their probabilities. And this just follows from the chain rule because this is equal to a given b probability of b and if this guy is probability of a then we have this equality okay so we usually use this other definition but it doesn't really matter okay so uh, what about if we have multiple events then things get a little bit tricky and in order to illustrate that we're going to work through an example okay so imagine that i have a probability space where we have two fair coin flips and we flip them uh, sorry, we have one coin and we flip it twice, okay? One, two, okay, we flip it twice. The possible outcomes are heads, heads, head, tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, okay? And now we're going to consider a collection of events, which is just the power set of all of these events, okay? So nothing um, fancy here. And our probability measure is going to be that essentially the flips all have the same probability of being heads and tails, so heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, heads, all have probability one fourth. Okay, so this is a probability space. And now we can start reasoning about whether certain events are independent or dependent. So let's define those events. We're going to define the events. The first flip is heads, the second flip is heads, and the two flips are the same. Okay, so now I would like you to think about how what, what outcomes are within um, first flip is heads. Again, pause the video and you know think a little bit about it. It's heads, heads, and head tails, right? What outcomes are in uh, event, event B, where, which is um, second flip is heads? It's heads, heads, and tails, heads. And now we have this other event, which is the two flips are the same. What outcomes are there? Heads, heads, tails, tails, right? So far, so good. Now let's consider whether these events are dependent or independent. And for that, we're going to con we're essentially going to compute the probability of uh, their intersection and see if it's the product of their individual probabilities. Okay, what's the probability that um, the first uh, flip is heads? Well, there's two options, right? Heads, tails, and heads, heads. These are two. Um, these joint events, they cannot happen at the same time. We can just add their probabilities. So it's going to be the union of these events. Um, they're disjoint. Each has probability one fourth. The probability is one half. What's the probability that the second flip is heads? Exactly the same thing, except that now it's two different events, right? It's heads, heads, or tails, heads. Union of these joint events. We can add their probabilities. Each has probability one fourth. Boom. One half also. What's the probability that um, the two flips are the same. This happens if we get heads, heads, and tails, tails. Same story. They're disjoint. We add up their probabilities. The probability is one half. Okay, so now let's take a look at the intersections. 
Okay, so we look at the intersection of A and B, B and C, and A and C. If the probability of the intersection is, the is equal to the probability of the product between these guys, then we'll say that the events are independent. Okay, so what's the intersection between A and B? Remember that A is first coin is heads, B is second coin is heads. This only happens if we have heads heads. So the probability of the intersection is just one fourth. Okay, very easy. What's the intersection between A and C? So first uh, coin is heads and two coins are the same. The two flips are the same. Um, this again only happens if you have heads and heads. So the probability is one fourth. Oh, by the way, sorry, I, I went a little bit too quickly. Um, this guy is indeed equal to one half times one half. So A and B are independent. Okay, we'll conclude that A and B are independent, which, you know, under in this, like the two coins, it doesn't seem that the two coins are related. The way we have defined the probability measure makes sense. Uh, so now, you know, we're going to see the way we have defined the, the probability measure. What's up with C? Is it independent from A and B? So as I was saying, the intersection between A and C, um, A and C only happen at the same time if you have heads heads. The probability of that is one fourth. This happens to be the product between the probability of A and the probability of C. So A and C are also independent, which kind of makes sense, right? Because the way we have defined things, if you know the outcome of the first coin flip, you still don't know what's going to happen with the second coin flip. So they could be the same or not the same if you condition on the first coin flip being heads. So that makes sense. OK, so now what's the intersection between uh, B and C? So the second flip being heads and the two flips being the same. We, you know, this might not come as a surprise. The intersection is again heads heads. Again, one fourth. Again, it's the same as the product. So these two guys are also independent. If you know about the second flip, um, you don't necessarily know whether the two flips are the same. There's still just one half probability that the flips are the same or not because the two flips are not related. I mean, this is just some intuition. According to a probability measure, um, all of these events are pairwise independent. So now my question to you is, are they are they actually independent, these events? Would you consider these events independent the way we have described this? So think a little bit about it because they're a little bit tricky. If they were independent, let's see what I've written here. Uh, if they were independent, you would expect that when you condition on also intersections of the other events, this should also not change things, right? So if, if, they depend, if the events don't depend on each other, if I know that A and B happened, then this should not affect the probability of C. So let's see if that is true. Uh, let's think about the probability of C given the intersection of A and B. That's the probability of the intersection between A, B and C divided by the probability of the intersection between A and B. The intersection between A, B and C is first coin, uh, first flip is heads, second flip is heads, and both flips are the same. That's just heads, heads, right? That's the intersection of those events. The intersection between A and B, we have already discussed this, is also heads heads. So we get that um, th this is the probability of heads heads divided by the probability of heads heads. The probability is one, which makes sense, right? Because if you know that the first flip was heads and the second flips what flip was heads, the two flips have to be the same. The probability that they're the same is one. Okay, that's very different to the probability that the two flips are the same if you don't have any information, which is one half. Okay, so this shows you that you cannot rely on pairwise independence to determine whether a group of multiple events are all independent. Okay, because of this, we need a stronger definition, which we call mutual independence. So if I have n events, those n events are only mutually independent if for any subset of m events, so this is a subset of m events, I can choose whichever, um, I can choose whichever of this, of these n events. Okay, so I choose m of them. For those, we must have that the probability of the intersection can be split up as the product of the individual probabilities. If this is true for any possible choice of M events among those N, then we do have mutual independence. And this essentially ensures that all these conditional um, probabilities, when you condition on, the inter on different possible intersections, they're all going to be the same as the prior probability. To give you an example, let's consider three events. Okay, 
um, A1, A2, and A3. And let's see, um, A3 conditioned on the intersection between A1 and A2. That's the probability of the intersection between the three of them divided by the, the probability of the intersection between A1 and A2. And now, if this is true, here M is equal to 2, right? And we have chosen A1 and A2. And here, up here, M is equal to N, and we have chosen A1, A2, and A3. By the definition of mutual independence, we can split these guys up into these products. And now we see that essentially everything cancels out except probability of A3, so which is the prior probability. So this ensures that when you condition on every possible intersection of any of the events, uh, the probability of uh, the event that we're interested in is going to be preserved. Okay, so here that was A3. We conditioned on the intersection between A1 and A2. Uh, the probability of A3 just remains the same because they're all mutually independent. So there's a big difference between things being pairwise independent and mutually independent, as shown by the previous example, where things were definitely not mutually independent. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had missed a step. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, a real data set, which is going to be the one that we used in the video on estimating probabilities uh, from real data. Uh, here we have the House of Representatives. Um, congressmen are voting on, on different issues. And if you remember, we had computed the, prob the empirical probabilities, empirical probabilities um, of uh, them voting yes for duty-free exports. So just to remind you, that would be uh, you would count all the yeses and divide by the total number. Okay, and that gave us, uh, you know, all the yeses are 172 divided by the total number 400. That gave us a probability of 0 0.43. And then when we considered the conditional probability of D given B, we would only consider... Oh, I think I, I just did that the other way around, right? Ah, no, no, I, I did it the right way, sorry. Like, so this divided by all of them um, would be the probability of D. Now, the problem with doing videos, by the way, is that you cannot just stop me and say, what the hell are you doing? Um, which you can do in class, right? Where you, if I start saying something that doesn't make sense. So anyways, you, you can maybe tell me in the comments what can we do. Uh, okay, so um, here we're conditioning on the probability of the budget being a yes here in this second line. So now we're only considering these guys. And the probability of D given B is this divided by that total. And we see that it changes a lot, so these things are clearly not independent, okay, by our definition of independence. Let's consider two different issues, which are immigration and an anti-satellite test ban. Again, I don't know what was going on in, in 1984, I haven't really looked it up. Um, but these were two other issues, so now we're going to do exac exactly the same thing. We're going to compute the probability of A, which is going to be... Uh, yeah, A is this guy, so it's uh, the probability of this. So we're going to count, we're just applying empirical probabilities again. So we're going to count uh, how many outcome, in how many, out, how many outcomes are in A divided by the total. Okay, that's 237 divided by 419. Um, notice that a different number of um, representatives showed up to vote for these two issues. And this will happen often in data, right? Like you have this missing data, noisiness kind of thing. So it's, it's good to realize. Uh, anyways, so we have this uh, probability of voting yes for the anti-satellite test ban. We do exactly the same thing for immigration. So this will be these guys divided by the total. And again, whenever, you know, like pause and try to do it yourself. I think that probably will be useful. Um, we get this other probability. And now we look at the probability of their intersection. Think about what that would be. It's a probability. It's basically this number divided by the total. Right? Because only these outcomes are in the intersection of yes and yes. Okay, so that probability is equal to 0 0.296. And now we're going to compare it to the product of these two guys. And it's actually quite similar. Very, very similar, in fact. Okay? So it looks like these two guys are almost independent. Okay? If we look at the conditional probability of um, A given I, so for immigration, yes, we look at 124 divided by that total, turns out that that probability is actually quite similar to this guy. So I'm saying, you know, this seem to be independent. 
And the one, those of you that are more mathematically uh, minded would be like, uh, wait a minute, you know, hold your horses, Carlos. Um, you have told us that independence only holds if this equality holds exactly. So what's going on here? Okay, that, you know, like uh, these are not independent by our definition. And that's where I think it's useful to mix statistics and probability or real life and mathematics, because we already saw that empirical probabilities are actually not exact, okay? Because there's this issue that you also always have limited data. So you could have independent events that, pro that seem dependent. And it's a really important question about how to determine whether things are really independent or not, which we're gonna tackle in hypothesis testing. But before that, I want to make this extremely clear. It's, it's very important to realize that these mathematical definitions sometimes don't directly apply to data because of inaccuracies in the data. Um, and to illustrate that, let's look at another real data set. And here, I, I want to stress that I just came up with this example. I looked up stuff in Wikipedia. I, I, I didn't like, you know, uh, cherry pick until I got like something very strange. I just thought of this example. I looked up the data and this is what I got. Okay. Okay. So we're going to uh, examine the relationship between two events. Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl. And there's a category five hurricane, that's the highest category, so natural disaster, in the North Atlantic Ocean. Okay. So uh, from 2001 to 2020. Okay. So since Tom Brady started winning Super Bowls, basically, here the ticks indicate that Tom Brady won. Uh, the ticks on this first row. On the second row, the ticks indicate that there was a hurricane of, oops, not there, of category five. Okay. So for example, in 2003, there was both. So now let's compute the probability that there's a hurricane and the probability that there's a hurricane if Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl. Okay, probability of hur hurricane, what are we going to do? We're going to divide the count of um, instances where there is a hurricane divided by the total. So these are one, two, three, four. Let me not miss any. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and the total are 20, 20 years. So that probability is 0 0.4. There's a 40% probability that in a given year, there's going to be a hurricane in the North Atlantic, according to this data. Now we want the conditional probability um, that there's a hurricane and Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl. So now we can only consider um, those years where Tom Brady won the Super Bowl. And out of those, we're asking in how many of those was there a hurricane? And the answer is one, two, three, four. So it's four out of seven. So the conditional probability is 0 0.571. Okay, so I hope this illustrates the point that I was trying to make before. Would you, you know, if, if Tom Brady happens to win the Super Bowl again next year, um, like in February, should we all go and, um, uh, you know, and, and start, uh, you know, like preparing for, for a hurricane in Florida? Probably not, because uh, we can be relatively sure that these two events are, are independent, uh, no matter how powerful uh, Tom Brady may seem at times. Um, so what's going on here? Basically, we have limited data. If you, you know, if, if like the Atlanta Hawks hadn't been super unlucky, I think in 2018, the probability would change a lot, right? If suddenly there, there hadn't, you know, Tom Brady hadn't won there. And maybe, they, it, you know, they had won against the New York Giants in one of these years, I forget which. Um, that would completely change the probabilities. So basically the, the point here is that when you have limited data, you cannot establish independence between events um, like with the like the rigorous mathematical formula, because you're never going to get probability that the probability of the intersection is exactly the same as the probability of the product. We're going to talk a lot more about this uh, when we talk about hypothesis testing, but I just wanted to warn you uh, that when you look at real data, things are going to get messy. Okay, so now let's talk about conditional independence, which is another very important concept. Um, two events are going to be conditionally independent given another event C when if we are conditioning on C, the probability, the conditional probability of A given B 
is exactly the same as the probability of A. Again, always conditioning on C. So this is exactly the same as uh, the normal definition of independence, except that we're conditioning on another event. And this should not be a problem, right? Because when we, um, when we define conditional probabilities, we explain that once we condition on an event, we have a new probability space. We can just reason about this new probability space as if it was a normal probability space. So here you can just think about it in this way. You are, we have conditioned on C, you know, um, now we're seeing whether these two guys are independent after updating anything, everything, after updating everything, having conditioned on C. Okay, that's, that's what we're doing. Equivalently, the probability of the intersection given that set C that we're conditioning on is the same as the product of the conditional probabilities of each of them. Okay? We again have this issue where if you have multiple events and you want to show that they're conditionally independent, mutually conditionally independent, you have to be very careful about conditioning on these other intersections. It's the same as in, as in the case uh, with these coin flips that we explained a moment ago. In order to ensure that things are mutually conditionally independent, um, you need this to hold. So basically that the intersection between M of them uh, is the same. So the, prob the probability of the intersection of M of the N events. So, okay, let me start again. You have N events, A1 to AN. Now for any M subset of these guys, any subset with M of these guys, it has to hold that the probability of their intersection given C is the same as the product of their individual probabilities given C for any possible subset that contains M events and for any M that is smaller or equal to N. Okay, exactly the same as in the normal case. Um, okay, so now let's take a look at some examples to see what is the difference between independence and conditional independence. So now we're going to, go, we're going, we're going to go back to modeling like when flights are late. I mean, this is, you know, well, maybe more before when we used to fly more, no? but that this is kind of like when you're like studying in New York, for example, or working in New York, you fly all the time. Anyways, I'll stop rambling and get to the example. Um, now we're going to incorporate taxi availability uh, in our model for flight delay. So we have that the probability of rain is 0.2. The probability of a plane being late if it rains is 0.75. The probability that a plane is late if it does not rain is just 0.125. Okay. The probability that there are taxis available when you are when the flight arrives is 0.1 if it's raining because everyone is taking cabs in the city, so there's less taxis. And um, if it's not raining, it's much higher. Okay? And we're going to assume, and this is an assumption we are going to make, that given that it rains or that it doesn't rain, L and T, so late and taxes, are conditionally independent. So I assume that it's raining. Now I'm going to assume that the flight being late has nothing to do with there being taxis at the airport, which is quite reasonable because what's the connection? There's no causal connection, like because there's suddenly there's no flights, sorry, no taxis in the airport. That doesn't mean that the flight is going to be late, right? There's, there's no connection between them. So this seems to be um, quite intuitive. So now the question is, under all of these conditions, is it true that um, taxis and late are actually independent. I just said that there's no connection between them, no? So you might say, yeah, there's no connection between them. Like, you know, taxis being late, like, sorry, there are not being any taxis. It's not going to affect the flight being late. So end of story. It's not the end of story because of this other quantity, R, that kind of connects both, as we'll see in a moment. So, but let's do this, um, you know, let's calculate things rigorously. As always, I think it would be helpful if you just did it on your own. A piece of paper, but we're all adults, you do whatever you want. Okay, so what's the probability of taxi given our assumptions? Um, we know the probability of rain, we know the conditional probabilities, we can just apply the chain rule. So this is going to be the probability of rain and then um, taxi given rain plus the probability of taxi given no rain times the probability of no rain. Okay, so no Surprise here, 0 0.5. That's the probability of finding a tax. We have aggregated, right, these conditional probabilities. Um, this is the law of total probability. Okay. Again, I don't usually think of this in terms of, oh, I've applied this identity. It's more like, why, why do these equalities hold? 
Okay, so now let's take a look at probability of taxi given that um, the plane is late. And now here, I think this is going to show you the importance of not relying on just blindly applying identities that uh, or you know equations that we already know hold. It's important to actually understand why the equalities hold. So okay, so let's see. By definition, this is the probability of uh, the intersection between taxi and late divided by the probability of late. I'm not very worried about the probability of late. I know how to compute it, right? But this one seems a little bit more tricky because I only have the probability of taxi and rain in terms of, uh, sorry, taxis and late in terms of rain, right? So now, and these guys are, we're not assuming their independence. So I cannot just say this is the probability of a taxi times the probability of late. I, I cannot assume that. We have, we're not assuming this, right? We're, in, we're only assuming conditional independence given rain. So I somehow need to include rain in there. And the way I do it is I say, okay, at the end of the day, the intersection between taxi and late is the same as, is a union of two things, the intersection of taxi late and rain and taxi late and no rain. Introducing this additional variable because we only know uh, the probabilistic behavior of the other variables or events uh, through this uh, variable or event is super important. We do it all the time in probabilistic modeling, okay? And the way we arrive at this is, oh, you know, everything has to do with rain. I better include it, right? I better include it. And how can I include it? Well, I need to express this guy as a union of two events that have something to do with rain. These are the two events that have something to do with rain. Uh, law of total probability, if you want. Okay. So now I need to split these guys. And in order to split them, okay, maybe this I'll do a little bit kind of separately. Uh, I can just use a chain rule. And now here um, is one of those instances where it's very important how you apply the chain rule. So we know the probability of rain. We don't know the probability of late or the probability of taxi. So we better take out rain first because then we're going to get conditional probabilities on rain. And that's exactly what we want. So we take out probability of rain. This is times probability of, for example, taxi given rain. And now this is times probability of late given taxi and rain, because remember that in the chain rule, we take out an event and then we have to condition on everything we've taken out before. Okay, remember that. Uh, now, what is this guy equal to? We have assumed conditional independence, right? So given R. So this means that this is just equal to P of L given T. Okay, okay so now I can plug this thing in and this exactly what I, I'm, I'm, you know, I went ahead like, and I already said this was equal to the probability of taxi given L, but otherwise that's it. Um, we, we do exactly the same thing for this term. And here we apply conditional independence given the complement of R. And when we do that, we get that this is equal to this and this is equal to this. And now we have everything we need. We can just plug in the numbers. And when we plug in the numbers, we get 0 0.3, which is very different to 0 0.5. So this implies that conditional independence does not necessarily imply independence. And it's important to think why this makes sense, because it's true that the plane is not affected by there being taxes or not. But there is a third phenomenon, that is the rain, that affects both. So if we know that uh, the plane was late, that kind of tells us that it probably rained. You know, we, we applied base rule to actually compute this a bit more precisely, like, like the probability of rain actually goes up. And then if we know that it probably rained, then there's going to be less taxes, right? Which is why this probability is smaller than this one. So because of this other phenomenon that affects both, uh, there's no independence. Like they're not independent. They're being taxes and the plane being late. Um, it, they're not independent. However, it is reasonable to assume that uh, they are conditionally independent if the only event, the only other phenomenon that affects both is the ring. Okay, so conditional independence does not imply independence. Okay, so now let's do another example also to do with flights um, where we're going to assume independence. Okay, and then let's see what happens with conditional independence. So here, uh, we're, we're gonna consider a mechanical problem in the, um, in the airplane. And what we're saying is that the probability of uh, having uh, the plane having a mechanical problem is 0.1, which is way too high. Obviously, planes don't usually have mechanical problems this often, but the probability of rain is going to be 0.2. And then we know the 
conditional probabilities of late, conditioned on, rate and on rain, and conditioned on the mechanical problem. When there's a mechanical problem, you're more likely to be late, which makes sense, right? Um, and we also know that the probability of late given that th there's no rain and there's a mechanical problem is one half. Okay, and this is what we're going to assume here. We're also going to assume that mechanical problems and it raining or not um, have nothing to do with each other. They're independent. Okay, so in particular, there being a mechanical problem and they're not being, they're, it's not raining, there's no connection. Okay, maybe we can imagine that the mechanical problem happens during the flight and rain is only here on arrival because otherwise there could be some connection, right? Like if there's a hurricane, something, maybe that would produce a mechanical problem. But anyways, I'll stop rambling and let's get to the math. Okay, so our question now is, these two guys were assuming they're independent, these two events. Are they also conditionally independent? Are they conditionally independent in particular given L? So if, you know, um, if we know that it didn't rain, uh, this doesn't give us any information about the mechanical problem. Uh, if we know that it didn't rain and we also know that it was that the plane was late, does this give us information about the mechanical problem? First, we're going to go through the math and then we're going to, uh, you know, reason intuitively about it. Okay, so what's the probability of having a mechanical problem given that the plane was late? So here we just apply the definition. This is the probability of the intersection divided by probability of late. We can compute easily compute the probability of the intersection by the chain rule, just by multiplying those two probabilities. Okay, and here we apply the law of total probability. We've done this 20 times. It's always the same. Boom, 0 0.28. Okay, Okay. so now this is a little bit more complicated. The probability of the, having a mechanical problem, given that the plane is late and given that um, it does not rain. And here, when we see something complicated like this, and, and we actually don't have enough information to go about it, okay, uh, what you need to do is go to the definition. What is this object? Like, let, you know, write down the definition of the object to try to get a little bit of an intuition. The definition of the object is the intersection between all of these guys and the probability of the intersection between these guys. Okay, so now things become a little bit easier, right? Because now we can think. Okay, what is this equal to? This probability of late, not rain, and mechanical problem. <clears throat> we can just apply the chain rule. But, once again, it's very important to apply the chain rule in the right order. So here we see that we know the probability of late given um, no rain and mechanical problem. So we better take out no rain and mechanical problem before. If we take out L before, we're going to be lost. So I'm going to take out mechanical problem. Then I'm going to write no rain given mechanical problem. And then late given um, no rain and mechanical problem. This is just the chain rule. Okay, and now here, do we know this guy? The answer is yes, because uh, no rain and mechanical problem are independent. So this is equal to the probability of no rain, which is 0 0.8. So that's how we deal um, with that. And then for, for this, we actually uh, this is actually very easy to deal with because we have these probabilities, so it's just by the chain rule. Okay, so again, we expand this, and the important part here is that we have expanded it in a clever way to make sure that we use the information that we have. So when you're expanding the like events using the chain rule, you really need to make sure that you can exploit the, the, the data that you have available. Um, here we um, we're going to use um, the independent assumption. Okay, we just use the independent assumption, so we can just plug in the probability of the complement of R, and when we plug in all the numbers, 0 0.8. And this is very different to 0 0.28. Uh, while I was computing this, I realized that I have a, a huge spoiler up here. A huge spoiler that is actually occluded by my video, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> or maybe it, it, it's a half spoiler, right? Like, what does it say under there? It says independence does not imply conditional independence. Um, as we see in this example, let's reason 
about this. Um, even if the mechanical problem and um, and the, the plane being laid are independent, they're both again um, related to rain, right? So, um, so then let's let's think about these two probabilities. Um, then we have a certain probability of the, um, there being a mechanical problem if the plane is late. Oof, sorry, what was I saying there? Okay, let me backtrack here. Uh, because I said that the mechanical problem and late were independent. They're definitely not independent. Sorry about that. No rain and mechanical problem are independent. Okay, I'm a bit tired. I've been like doing a lot of videos. Um, so no, no rain and mechanical problem are independent. Um, does that mean that... Um, um, yes, sorry. Right. Does that mean that mechanical problem and no rain are independent if we know that the plane is late? Okay, if we don't know whether the plane is late, there being a mechanical problem on the flight and it raining or not, we're assuming it's independent. But now we know that the plane was late. So if we know that the plane was late, it can be because of two reasons. It can be because of the mechanical problem or because of the rain. So now they're connected, right? Um, so because... Uh, because of this connection, now uh, actually the probabilities change. Because if we know that the plane was late and it did not rain, then automatically the probability of a mechanical problem goes up because that's probably why the plane was late, or I mean, more likely why the plane was late, right? If we knew that it was raining, then we would be like, oh, it was raining, so maybe it wasn't because of the mechanical problem. Okay, so I, I hope that makes sense, right? Um, the mechanical problem and, and no rain are indeed independent, but they both affect late. So if we reveal late, uh, this actually changes the dependence between the two events. And this just shows you how tricky, because I always get confused when I have to explain this again, especially if I'm tired. This is show you how tricky a dependence structure is, because it can really change a lot depending on what you condition on. Um, just to um, illustrate this further, Let's go back to our example with the House of Representatives and the votes. So we had seen that D and B uh, were clearly uh, not, um, not independent. And now um, we can think of the following, like, is the dependence due to political affiliation? And in order to answer that question, we're going to divide the votes between uh, votes of Republicans, and we'll see in a moment the votes of Democrats. So now we're going to compute the probability of B and D, given that um, the representative was a Republican. I've, al I've only put Republican votes here, so we're already kind of implicitly conditioning on Republican. Um, the probability of the intersection between D B and D is 7 uh, divided by the total. Okay. If we want the probability of B given R, we have to take B divided by the total and the probability of a d given r is here it's going to be 14 divided by the total okay and now we see that <coughs> the, the when we multiply these two numbers we get a number that is quite different to this number so even if we con condition on republican these two quantities do not seem to be independent now let's condition on um, the the representative being a democrat Excuse me. So, oh, and here I, I just computed the conditional probability of B. So that would be here, conditioned on D and Republican. So it's going to be 7 over 14, which is 0 0.5, um, which is quite different to uh, the probability of B just given Republican, right? So these probabilities are, are quite different. So it's clear that these two events are not independent. Okay, so now let's see what happens if I uh, condition on Democrat. Here, there's a bit of a confusion, like D would seem to indicate Democrat, but that already means like this duty-free issue. So Democrat is going to be the complement of R. Sorry about, you know, that possibly confusing notation. Let's do exactly the same thing. Let's look at um, the intersection of B and D given Democrat. That's this divided by the total. Um, uh, the probability of B, which is yes on budget, divided by the total. And the probability of D, 
which is yes on duty free exports divided by the total. Okay. Now we take, we multiply together and we actually get something that is very close to, um, um, so what, what, what am I saying here? The probability of the intersection uh, conditioned on Democrat is actually very close to the product on the, of the individual conditional probabilities, which indicates that these events are probably approximately independent. If you look at the conditional of B um, given D and Democrat, that's 144 divided by 158, it's quite similar to the probability of B if you only uh, condition on Democrat. So essentially what this is telling us is if someone is a Democrat, then the two issues are not that connected anymore. The likelihood that they vote yes on budget if they have voted yes on duty-free export is not is essentially the same as the probability of them voting yes for, for budget, or, or it's very close. So if someone is a Democrat, then knowing how they voted for duty-free e um, exports does not tell, give us information about um, how they're going to vote for budget, or rather them voting yes for duty-free exports does not give us information about how they vote about budget. Um, this was definitely not the case if there were Republicans. So this actually shows you that it's very tricky. Depending on what you condition on, you can condition on Republicans and then uh, there's no conditional independence. You condition on the complement and boom, there's conditional independence. So conditional independence really depends on what you're conditioning on. Okay, like the dependence structure is very tricky. So what have we learned here? We have learned the definition of pairwise independence, mutual independence of multiple events, and uh, the extension of these concepts to conditional probabilities through conditional independence, where we condition on a third event or on several other events. And then we saw that um, conditioning can be dramatically affected by um, the dependence between the events. Uh, sorry. Again, I'm, I'm tired. I, I, was, I was saying that and I was like, wait, isn't it the other way around? Yes, it's the other way around. Conditioning can dramatically vary the dependence between the events. The dependence between the events can be dramatically affected by conditioning. Okay. And finally, we've seen that, you know, when we encounter real data, then things are become a bit messy, right? Because things are not exactly equal to each other, even if you do probably have independence, again, unless there's something really shady going on with Tom Brady. Um, so when we encounter real data, we're going to need additional statistical tools to really come to a conclusion about whether things are independent or not. Thank you very much.